Friday, as he does often uh, each year. Uh, Shay and I will be traveling together with JJ and Cameron to our annual conference in Phoenix. Uh, the annual conference is our, our yearly gathering of clergy and lay delegates to uh, be about the business of our United Methodist Church. Uh, and then when I come back, we'll, we'll finish the series with uh, three more weeks all about John Wesley and uh, what he teaches us. And what we'll miss next week or the end of the series, so I invite you all to be here. Let us pray. Pray the Lord, touch the hearts of those who hear my words this morning. Let my words be yours. Allow them to seep into our hearts and minds and may this message transform our congregation. Amen. Well, I'm going to start this morning with a quiz. Now, those of you with test anxiety, I know y'all just went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Hopefully. And I'll be ready on a curve so, you know, no one will absolutely fail. Uh, so don't worry. But I'm going to share uh, a short biography of three different people. And, and your job is to tell me who it is, all right? So the first person, great in billions, B billions, the merchandise, movies, theme parks around the world. But he had a bit of a difficult start. You see, he was fired by a newspaper editor because they said he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. But after that, this mystery man started a business that didn't last too long, several businesses, and he ended up in bankruptcy and failure. But he kept plugging along and eventually found a recipe for success that worked. Who can tell me? Walt Walt Disney, right? I love that he was told he lacked imagination. (laughs) Have you ever received a criticism and you thought, what? Alright, the next one. Most people know this woman as one of the most iconic faces on TV, as well as one of the richest and most successful women in the world. But she also faced a difficult road to get to that position, enduring a rough and often abusive childhood, as well as numerous career setbacks, including being fired from her job as a television reporter because they said she was unfit. For TV. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got six or eight. All right, the last one. Most people wouldn't believe that a man often wanted as the best basketball player of all time, that may be your best was actually cut from his high school basketball team. Michael Jordan. Luckily, he didn't let the setback keep him from playing the game, and he shared he missed more than 9,000 shots, lost 300 games. On 26 occasions, he was entrusted to take that game-winning shot, and he failed. He failed again and again and again, and he said that is why he succeeded, and you already get my career. Failure can be just the catalyst that we need to grow into greatness. The Bible is full of stories of great failure and God's loving grace, guiding his people toward new opportunities, new experiences, and God can take us places we can barely dream of going. That growth and enlightenment doesn't often come when we are successful, when things are going well, when there isn't great strife. A crisis of faith can be seen as a failure, and it's through that failure that we can learn and grow. James chapter 1 verses 2 to 4 has, I think, the best advice in the entire Bible. My sisters and brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Our founder, John Wesley, faced trials. Things did not come easy for him. He lived his life in England, striving for holiness, working daily to exhibit just the right spiritual discipline that he hoped would bring him into a closer relationship with God. For many of us, the, the struggle
struggle to pursue a good spiritual life means balancing the quest for holiness with the trust and confidence in God's grace by which we are saved. In other words, when we are focused on our own pursuits of holiness, we may find the goal elusive and may never be certain that we've done enough to please God. Some find themselves a close friend of failure. John Wesley struggled in just such a way. He focused so much on pursuing holiness that he lost balance in focusing on the rigorous activities like awakening every morning to pray, fasting twice a week, studying the Bible for hours each day, receiving the Eucharist twice a week, sometimes daily. Wesley regularly visited prisoners and the sick and elderly. He refused to cut his hair and instead gave the money he would pay the barber to those who were in need. And while all of these are good pursuits of holiness, there is a risk that in too much activity, we forget about grace. Being justified with God is not about what we do, but what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. I think of the Apostle Paul, who prior to his Christian conversion had been zealous for the law, working to experience God's acceptance, but never feeling as if he had done quite enough. And it was only when he encountered Jesus and came to apprehend, accept, and articulate the truth of salvation by grace through faith that Paul was set free from his desperate attempt to win God's favor. Paul notes in Galatians 2.16, a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe, he says, in Christ Jesus, so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. Let that sink in. No one will be justified by the work of the law. If you are working hard to gain God's favor, stop it. God wants you, not your hard work. If you feel you are never good enough, you don't volunteer enough, you don't give enough to your church, stop it. There aren't enough committees to join, enough mission trips to take, enough pumpkins to unload <laughs> that will change your relationship with God. A relationship changes only and because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and taking our sin as his own. In that instant that we accept Jesus as our Savior, that moment that we say yes to Christ and no to the world, we are saved by grace alone. The work we do does not matter. Our own success or failure means nothing to God. Now, of course, as people saved by grace, we desire to share God's love as we become the hands and feet of Christ in our community, which may mean serving on a committee here at church, or volunteering to help clean up trash at the lake, or serve meals to the homeless with family Thomas, or making masks for those in need. The difference is our motive. Are we giving out of our love of God or fear that we aren't somehow doing enough? Is our heart filled to overflowing and then sharing with those around us? Or is it empty and we attempt to fill it with false things? In Wesley's head, he knew salvation was purely a gift. But often in his heart, he seemed to be seeking God seeking to somehow win his acceptance. Wesley's struggle, struggle ultimately led to a crisis in his own faith, similar to Martin Luther's 200 years before. 
1732, John convinced his brother Charles to go to Savannah, Georgia on a mission to convert the natives and to be in ministry with the colonists. It was a huge success for John. He was deathly afraid of the ocean. The journey would require over three months at sea. And I wonder if subconsciously one would believe that if he literally risked life and limb, if somehow that would prove his commitment to God and his own desire to live a holy life. Now, the journey across the ocean turned out worse than he could have imagined. The ship encountered storm after storm after storm. He was sure he would perish. The storm shook him to his core and led him to question his faith. For Wesley, the Atlantic storm demonstrated the inadequacy of his cerebral and often work-oriented faith. On January 25, 1736, he recorded in his journal the climax of these storms at sea. The mainsail, he wrote, were in tatters. Waves washed over the ship and water poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. He observed that the English passengers were screaming in terror. You can imagine as was he. But a group of Ger German Moravians calmly sang a song. So picture it. You're sure you're going to die. Half the ship is screaming in terror, and here sits this group of Christians calmly singing. That encounter with the Moravians affected him deeply, leading him to focus on the inner assurance of faith that he had longed for but had not yet received. In that storm, seeds were planted that would be watered over the next two years and would finally bloom one day in the altar stage. Now, in writing in Georgia, he became more rigorous in his faith and alienated his young congregation. He was accused of being too strict, of adhering to standards that were impossible to meet. It wasn't that he required his entire congregation to attend a 5 a.m. prayer service every day. Great idea. <laughs> but to those who didn't attend, he would refuse the Eucharist. Where is the grace? There's a fine line between a passionate pursuit of holy living and an unhealthy legalism focused on rules and guilt. While in Georgia, Wesley became smitten with a woman, but he didn't feel like he could uh, continue in a relationship because it would distract him from his mission with God. And when she became engaged to someone else, he became so angry that he refused her communion, even though she had come forward to receive it. Wesley was displaying what some would call a pharisaic tendency, <laughs> characterized by other things. By faith, their rules dominate and others are judged harshly. When you have an unbalanced faith, focused on the pursuit of holiness without a corresponding experience of grace, then we also become like the Pharisees. Now, failing miserably in Georgia, they ran out of town, <laughs> Wesley returned to England and sought out the spiritual direction of a Moravian missionary. And he advised Wesley to preach faith until you have it. And then once you receive it, you will then preach faith. That was the original, fake it till you make it, I think. <laughs> Wesley continued to see God and the close relationship that he desired, but he still focused on his actions. And on the night several years later, in Alder State, many of you have heard this story, Wesley shared that he felt his heart strangely warm. And in that moment, he discovered the grace that he had been hotly pursuing. 
he receives God's gift, free gift of grace. And Wesley's faith moved from his head to his heart, and that made all the difference. He realized that it wasn't the rules and law that were required, but a sincere and simple faith in our Creator. Paul says in Romans, now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. Those of you who are still working, we work to get paid, right? At the end of the week, you tally up your hours and you expect to be paid commensurate with the time that you have spent. We, we don't consider that a gift, do we? <laughs> wages are not reckoned as a gift but as something do. But to one who without work trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. Anyone need a translation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we trust in God, that's enough. When we trust in God, that is enough. Paul continues in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, since we are justified by faith, and I would argue faith alone, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. You know, God knows we don't deserve it. And he loves us all the more. God will take <coughs> our lack of faith. He will take our failures and he will turn them into something grand if only we will put our trust in him. Oh. It's God calling. Get up. It's closing. Some will say that our move here to St. Jude's was a horrible failure. The traffic getting here is awful. The floor is uneven, and don't get me started on the chairs. <laughs> and then there are those who can't attend, literally because of the scent of the flowers and candles. This makes space is too small, and there doesn't seem to be enough room for two congregations to share peacefully. But you know what? That's not how I see it. I see it as an opportunity. We have found just another place that is no longer ideal for us. We have Fred Yamagata's garage, the Episcopal Church, the Lighthouse, the Senior Center, and now St. Jude. And I am excited to see where God is leading us. Through the testing of our faith, we will continue to be refined and grow closer to Christ. And that Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us through our failure. We know that through trials you refine us and bring us forward to a new and fresh relationship with you. Remind us all that it is through your grace that we are here. <laughs> that you love us, not because of the work we do, but because we love you and live our lives to honor you.